to make sure. Right. Um, still need one more trustee for a quorum. So, um, okay. well, we have a quorum. We have a quorum. Who is um, who are we missing? So I know Cherry's not. Is Alice going to make it? I didn't hear from Alice. Wait a minute, yeah. and then just seven o'clock. Flower. <laughs> oh, oh. It's a thing. I remember hours living, hours living his best life with everybody home. Oh. Yeah. Andrew, oh, you're, you're muted. muted. Hello. I'll mute myself. Uh, well, this is my fifth one of these today. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'm even time. So. I guess we can get started if, um, do we need to give the uh, okay TV? Are we... I think I think we've gone live. We've gone live, okay. You said at seven o'clock we go live. I'll just, if Alice pops in, I'll just, I'll just admit her. <clears throat> Great, uh, welcome everybody. Good to see everybody, at least visually. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, so this is the Board of Library Trustees meeting. So I'm just going to read at the beginning there, Amy, just so you know, the public, anyone out there that is watching, if you have any sort of questions or, or want to send anything, we have a, an email address, which I'll read, uh, which you can send them to. The email address will be monitored, but uh, we will have, we'll respond to any sort of comments in the next meeting, um, in all likelihood. That email is rdgadmin at noblenet.org. So rdgadmin, A-D-M-I-N, at N-O-B-L-E-N-E-T dot org. Uh, and uh, just a note for the trustees, if we do need to take any votes tonight, what we have to do is we have to go through a roll call vote. So we have to I'll just call in an individual. I just need to state your name and then say yes or no. So uh, the first item on the agenda is the are the minutes from way back on March 9th. Has uh, everyone had a chance to take a look at them? Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, comments or additions or corrections? No. I didn't have any when I looked at them. Okay. Okay, well, if not, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Move. Okay, so we so have Monette uh, moving, Andrew second. And then, so I will go through and do a roll call. So we'll start in the order I see. So uh, Monette? Approved. Okay. Um, Nina? Approved. Okay. Andrew? Approved. Okay. And John, I approve. So the motion carries. Uh, the financial update. Uh, Amy, over to you. Um, basically, um, we're a little behind, which isn't, um, on, which isn't really surprising. Um, but we are not too far off. We just received a whole bunch of stuff in. We um, part of the part of the issue in the lag is that we did have trouble coordinating UPS deliveries of our materials. Um, so some things got sent back, and then we had to get them again. So um, we're now receiving our fiscal materials and um, processing invoices for that. There should be another bill roll coming out this week that um, that we'll process and send out too. Thank you very much for being so accommodating. Um, but our materials is going along. Our salary budget is running a little under, um, mostly because we we are not using our Sunday money, and um, also you know things like vacations and time off and substitutes were all canceled. So um, we're running a little bit under um, where we normally would be at this point. So um, in general, it looks good. Um, we don't have any revenue that comes in particularly, although we did get our second um, batch of state aid. Um, Hopefully, we'll continue to get that next year. We have no idea what state aid will look like, um, but in general for this year, I think it was like $33,000. Good. Good. 
Uh, and the trusts are all down. <laughs> all the investments are down. Yeah. To, be, to be expected. Yeah. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, have you seen a material increase in the online um, budget? Yeah. Uh, the, the number of the usage and I imagine usage, but also, yeah. Yes, so we've been buying a lot more, um, particularly the eBooks and e-audio books. Um, and, you know, obviously that's something we're promoting. Um, we just, just uh, this week um, got our numbers and we're going through those, but in general, most of our numbers were up. When we looked at, during April, when we looked at the March numbers, there was definitely an increase for the second half of March. Um, so we expected that to, to increase, you know, continue, continue upwards. Um, having said that, we are trying to look pretty critically at anything that we're investing in. So um, if we're increasing our eBooks, are people using eBooks? If we're increasing um, uh, access to New York Times or something like that, what, you know, what's the usage on that? Unfortunately, it's just really hard to get those numbers. Um, we have April. We're just we're just getting April now, so we expect to have reports on that in the next week or so. All the social media numbers are up, by the way. <laughs> Twitter is Twitter's like Twitter's. Michelle could maybe speak to this, but Twitter's like through the roof. Um, but all of the Instagram, like the story times, and all of the things that we're doing in that that venue, the engagement is up something like five hundred, some ridiculous number of percent. Awesome. It is nice. Yeah. Great. Any other uh, comments, discussion on the financials? You know, if, if not, why don't we go to the, uh, the biggest item here, which is the um, reopening discussion. Okay. Uh. So, um, Emmy, thanks. Thank, uh, so for those of you who don't know, this is Emmy Dove. She's the um, chair of the Board of Health who has been working, who has a real job and then volunteers for the town. And um, if you've tuned into the select board meetings at all or to the um, Board of Health meetings, um, they have been really, really busy. So first of all, thank you, one, for joining us and also for the amazing amount of work that you're doing for our town. And um, I know that we're working with you know, a whole bunch of different groups and you're concerned about the public, the businesses, the municipality, you have a lot of things that you're juggling. So, so thank you very much. Um, what I sent to the board and I mean, I think you may have had a copy was, um, it was just a draft. It hasn't been, I mean, it's been received by the incident command team who's working um, obviously in conjunction with the board of health when he's on the incident command team, the strategic command. And, um, it was, it's, it's basically four phases. There's a pre-opening, a phase one, phase two, and phase three. And I, I put down two weeks, but um, if you paid attention to what Governor Baker said and Karen Polito said today, um, it's, it doesn't have to be committed to two weeks, but we do know that there will be a multi-phase um, opening return to services, I'll say, for the library. And we based it not knowing you know, what they were gonna come out with today. Um, what we have actually isn't too distantly aligned from what that was presented today by the governor and the assistant and the lieutenant governor. Um, but the priority obviously is making sure that we have um, safety in place for our staff and the services that are returned or done uh, for the public are done in a very uh, methodical and again, safe way. Um, what we called the pre-opening was um, uh, basically getting our house in order. That's looking at the building that's getting returns. We have over 18,000 items out, which is pretty high. It's about over 17% of our physical materials um, and 18,000 items. We have to get those back in the building and get them prepped to go back out. Um, so that's the first phase. And then also during the pre-opening, we would be looking at all the materials that we've been receiving over the last month and a half. Those have to be processed. Things have to be claimed. If things we ordered have to be claimed, if they didn't come, that kind of thing. 
And we anticipate that being a minimum of two weeks and it could easily go longer before um, we're ready to offer something out, going outward. At that point, everything's coming into the library. Phase two, the next phase, which would really be phase one, would be the phase of return to some service for the public. And that would be something like curbside pickup or on demand. And that would be, um, um, we're still working out the details because we want to make sure that we can structure this. Um, I'll come back to the to the details of what we know of each of these, but the next, the, that, that other phase after returns would be some outgoing things that would be curbside pickup. Again, none of the public in the building. <laughs> Work that's going on in the building is by limited staff. And then after that phase, whatever that is, whenever we feel comfortable having people coming into the building, um, that would obviously be on a limited basis um, where we've already sectioned off, like, so for example, the computer setup, right now the computers are very close to each other. We would be working um, during the pre-opening and first phase to make sure our computer stations are appropriately socially distanced, either removing or blocking off seating so that, that people are socially distanced should they sit and read the paper, um, possibly lim you know, limiting things like that, making sure that we have appropriate signage, appropriate hand washing, I mean, we need all that for the staff to return to work, but we also need that for when and if, when we can really get the public back. So that would be very limited opening. And then the next phase would be a little bit more opening. I think that's the cautious maybe um, on, or vigilant maybe, that's the vigilant section on the current state plan. Um, so we have a start, we have a cautious, <laughs> and we have a vigilant. Um, and then we would, you know, we would just sort of open it up a little more. And then at some point we would get back to whatever is determined to be the new normal. Um, so those are the large broad stroke of the phases and of half of that, we're not letting any public back into the building. And that's an expectation that we're going to need to manage. I think the public want to come in. They're in the parking lot now and they want to come in, um, but we're just not comfortable with that. We already need to first manage our staff. Uh, we have a staff of, 26 FTE, 27 FTE, but it's about f almost 36 people. Um, and so we need to work with that staff, making sure they're safe, making sure we're on rotations and shifts. Um, and then, um, then we'll get the public back in. So those are the broad strokes. Um, one of the things that we're also working on the first phase, which is actually somewhat the most complex is the returns. The town has offered to do a um, large event like they did with the mass giveaway at the RMHS pipe parking lot, um, where we would take returns. Basically, we'd have red bins and people could have their stuff in paper bags, hopefully. They could just get out of the car, drop them in the bins. We'd transfer the bins over to a truck. Um, and then we would just sort of do a whole day of that. Um, the parking lot at the high school has the ability, um, if you, um, went to the uh, mask event, they have the ability to, to divert the traffic so there's a very long flow. And one of the problems with doing that in our parking lot is if, if we get more than like say 10 vehicles trying to drive around in a circle in the library parking lot, we could easily have a, we could have not, not I mean, don't, don't be offended. We could have the Bagel World line, which is, which is a problem. And we don't wanna see that happening in our residential neighborhood. So we wanna be very cognizant of the neighbors. So we wanna maybe do a big return at the, at the high school, followed by very specific times, um, you know, maybe like nine, you know, nine to 11 and then one to three um, available in the library parking lot so that we can, we can control the traffic there. And that's actually would probably involve also police details um, both at the high school and then it's possible depending on the rate of return that we would have to engage the police um, detail to direct traffic and things um, because again it's a residential neighborhood there's a lot of little kids they walk they like to walk and drive and walk their dogs in our, our neighborhood so we want to be very careful about the physical safety and um, that's one of the things I'm really really concerned about um, but then also getting the materials most of the studies that we've gone to, and I'd say we probably have well over 50% of our staff are attending <laughs> webinars on um, information that's changing day to day on how to quarantine this stuff. Um, paper and cardboard has a, different, um, has a different retention rate of the virus, but most of our books are covered in plastic. 
So at this point, we're anticipating a minimum of a 72 hour quarantine. Materials would come back into the building. They would be quarantined for 72 hours. At that point, they would be checked in. And at that point, they could be reshelved. Uh, we don't wanna run them through our machines. We don't wanna to touch them until they've been quarantined for an appropriate amount of time. The Institute of Museum and Library Services is running more tests. They will have more data hopefully in June on how this um, virus handles specifically with paper and um, plastic that's used to house books. And they're working on it very specifically. Um, and we're looking, you know, we're anxiously awaiting those results. But right now, some places are doing a week. Some places are doing 48 hours. Um, most of what we've learned um, indicates 72 hours seems appropriate, but guidance from other areas would be, you know, welcome. Amy, if we're, if you go with a scale at the high school and everything has to be put on a truck, could mm -hmm. it, could it just be on the truck for 72 hours and then it's physically touched or brought into the building? It's already passed? Yeah. Either, either way. I think it depends on how many trucks and how many we're going to, I think we're just not sure how many we'd get back at a large event. Yeah. We have, the town has several box trucks that they could use. Um, and, you know, as long as there's, I mean, this is a great time. The box trucks, you know, during the winter, the box trucks get used to bring snow blowers back and forth from location to location. But right now, as far as I know, they're, they're not, you know, and plus with the schools out, they're not doing as much maintenance between the school buildings. Um, they're working there, but they're not doing they're not transporting as much between buildings as they normally do. So we would have hopefully um, access to several vehicles. And um, but we, you know, since we're close to the public, we were really anticipating using those meeting rooms and the and the ground floor to house materials. And they they quite literally would be divided off by day. Um, you know, this, this you know this one arrived on Saturday, and this group arrived on Monday. That kind of thing. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> I actually have a couple of questions after reading through the plan. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them was, um, I noticed museum pass reservations was in week eight, or phase three week eight. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, is there a way to um, evaluate that individually? Because I know that like, uh, one of the ones that jumped out at me is the trustees observations has a staggered approach to how they're opening up some of their properties and some are opening next week. And so okay. um, I'm wondering if, if we, you know, work to sort of track our museum passes, if there'd be a way that we could have them, you know, people sign up for them if, if it's um, that have opened up. Sure, and uh, Michelle could speak to this, but I will say that I know that some passes are physical passes, in which case we don't wanna be handing them out and bringing them back, and that, that would be a problem. But yeah. there are other passes, and I don't know if the trustee could make an accommodation for that, where they're, they're printed home passes, where if you reserve it, you can just print it at home and use it. Mm -hmm. So um, we also have Spot Pond, and we, Michelle, do you know what else we have that are outdoors? Spot pond is definitely something that you could print at home um, and you would have to come in. Um, the mass parks pass you have to come in for. Okay. I'm wondering if a lot of the museums will be going towards printable now, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Do you think the mass parks, it's worth asking mass parks if they could, if we could do a version of that or whether they. Sure. I'll, I'm going to um, yeah. make a note. So I was on the website today, just looking at the museum passes. I was thinking about this. It, has our list dramatically changed? Cause like I didn't see Spot Pond and that might be because it, it's not opening yet. And I get that. Like, I also didn't see Day Cardova. That was another one I was thinking that I know I saw is starting to open. It's trustees. Yeah, okay. And so that might be why. Okay, I get it. Um, but I also know that, um, I'm actually, I'm not sure because Lauren Gardner is actually the person in charge of them now. So when we close, she might have blocked them all off. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. Got it. Um, okay. But that, that, Monette, that's a great question. If it's something that people can do from home and doesn't require coming to the library at all, yeah. um, then, um, and the service is available, then we should absolutely provide it. So yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm.
the, Amy, this is kind of a small question. Has there been any thought about like when we actually do get people back in the building and using resources like computers, is there a protocol or protocols in place for? That's an excellent question. <laughs> um, we have some folks attending a couple webinars, um, I think this week or next, on some different services for reservations. We've never done space, we've never done computer reservations before, but it's something we might want to think about because we will have limited. We're literally going to be cutting our computers in half. I mean, not, I'm sorry, that's wrong. We will be computer. We'll be setting the number of computer stations available in half. The computers will remain in whole. Um, but um, we are looking at also increasing, um, Michelle's pricing out Chromebooks mm -hmm. that we could possibly lend out. Um, again, we would need to figure out a way to disinfect them after each use, as we would have to with computer use. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that are that is sort of anxiety causing for us is that we have people using stuff all the time. Mm. Um, there's no way we can protect, we can't protect people. They have to be sensible and go use something and wash their hands. And you know, we have the restrooms, we have the hand sanitizer, but we can't um, protect, we can only protect people so far. Um, so, um, but having said that, um, the other thing that we've talked about doing, and I think um, we ran this by some folks, um, there's some concern. One of the things we talked about also doing is um, making sure our Wi-Fi gets out into the parking lot a little bit farther and um, either extending that to just 24 seven, allowing that available 24 seven. I think right now it's available from very early in the morning until fairly, it's, it's, it's open beyond library hours. Um, and we do find people parked in front of the building on the Middlesex side in front of the studio, um, hanging out and hitching onto the Wi-Fi, which is completely acceptable. We're paying for that Wi-Fi um, through Noble, through our subscription to Noble. We pay for that 24 seven. It's a public service. It's meant for people who cannot afford their own um, internet. Um, we wanted to possibly um, extend that out farther with some sort of um, additional hotspots. Um, into the parking lot. The cons biggest concerns, which are reasonable concerns, are if um, the parking lot would become overcrowded, whether people would be sitting in the parking lot with their windows open and playing loud music and, you know, sort of become a nuisance. Um, basically, it would be converting the parking lot from a public parking lot to a, a library service where people could hang out. So, um, to your point about reservations, yes, we will need to think about that. And I'd appreciate you, your input on in library space for computers, for sitting. Um, John, actually, you're a great person. You come in and you'll spend quite a bit of time. But if we have half as much seating, should we be limiting that seating at all? I'm not sure. Uh, it is a public building. Um, and then what can we offer outside of the building that would sort of be um, free? and easy, easily accessible that would extend the service. So if you weren't able to sit in the library, you could sit in your car and do, do some work, that kind of thing. So I appreciate your input on that. I mean, do we, this, is, this might be a silly question, but do we have any budget available? Would we be able to maybe buy some picnic tables to spread around outside? Yes, we have, yes. Yes, we could we at least, if, and if you space those out, you could at least afford the opportunity for like a family to come together where they could all sit together. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great idea. Advantage of the summer. And My only concern there is that we're not <laughs> allowing, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> all right, that's why you're here. Right. We're not allowing, you know, outdoor dining, for example, you know, they, they can't have picnic tables outside because we want to limit gathering. And of course, it's okay for a family unit to be doing that, but you just don't really want to encourage non-family units. Right? And that's what we see. We see a lot, right? So we see um, a lot of young people gathering together. Yeah. Um, and they're walking, at least most of them are walking um, because they don't have a place to sit. Um, so um, I think um, I think pending Board of Health advisory, we do have money. In answer to your question, yes, we have funds. We have 
donation from the foundation that we could easily use to purchase um, furniture for outside of the library um, for sort of that initial phase, like the going beyond the pre-opening and phase one of our process when we possibly would be allowing people to come onto the property for more than just picking up a, a bag of books or returning a bag of books. Um, and um, we could definitely pre-order some of that. Um, a lot of that has to do with landscaping, making sure we have flat, safe land. Um, you know, <laughs> the one side of the building is pretty, pretty cockeyed. Um, and also making sure that it's accessible in terms of handicap accessibility. I think that's the only thing we would really need to be concerned about. Not impossible. None of those are impossible. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that would definitely be in the sort of phase three kind of thing, phase three or phase four. Well, as you know, and I imagine a lot of this is going to be dictated by state and local guidelines. I mean, I imagine everyone's going to be wearing masks for the foreseeable future. You know, probably yeah, probably not expect. Um, you know, and there may be some ways, like I see, you know, I, I look at like South Korea, what's happening there, and just look at the visuals of what people are doing, you know, with adding plastic screens and different things. I mean, there's, there's potential ways to help uh, or to help mitigate. But um, yeah, I think we just look for any sort of ideas right now. I should have also mentioned that today I did meet with a vendor. We were both, both masks and stood very far apart from each other for measurements for some custom um, acrylic um, sneeze guards basically um, that have pass-throughs. Um, they'd have to be custom made because our desks are also so uniquely sized. So we're working, I'm working with, um, the folks who've done our signs, they have all the material and equipment to cut and shape acrylic um, panels. And um, so we're gonna come up with that. It's not, it's not perfect um, because again, you know, sometimes people are standing, sometimes they're sitting, sometimes people, um, sometimes people just like to walk around behind the desk and we're gonna have to figure out how to put barriers there. Um, the whole building was designed with a very open plan. So, so we will, I did have someone in today to work on um, some acrylic screening. Um, but having said that, um, I do think that while we're all in the building, everybody will be wearing masks, period. Um, staff members will be wearing masks if they're in the same space as another person. Um, we are working on rotations. Um, right now, they're, they're brushed out at um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And um, that kind of goes to the idea that no one's in the building. Um, if, if anyone on the you know team A goes down, then all of team A is quarantined. If anyone on team B goes down, then all of team B is quarantined. Um, so at any given point, we could lose half of our staff, um, but not all of our staff. So we, we should be able to deal with that. Um, uh, we're also, we're trying to divide that up both by tasks. So for example, Michelle and I are on opposite teams. Um, Michelle and I will probably not be in the same room together for quite a while, um, which is sad. Um, but um, but there's, always, there's always a senior administrator available six days a week. Um, so we're trying to work on those rotations. Um, it's there, you know, that's uncomfortable for some staff who have you know, worked Monday nights for the last 25 years. And now we're saying, could you work Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday during the day? So we're trying to work through some of those difficulties, but our goal is to get, is our goal is to, first of all, to keep everybody safe. And secondly, to keep everybody employed. So that's, that's kind of how, how, how that goes. Um, we have had a lot of questions from our, our employees about, is it safe? Um, we had questions today about the air exchange, which I was able to talk to Joe Huggins and get some information. Our building is actually quite good when it comes to air exchange. We have 100% fresh air coming in and 100% fresh air going, I mean, old air going out. So we have a great return system because it's such a new building. I don't know that you would find that um, in other buildings like Town Hall or the Pleasant Street Center or some of the schools might have older circulation systems. Um, the building is 40,000 square feet. 
don't ask me what the cubic footage is or the volume of air coming in or coming out, but with 40,000 square feet, I'm pretty sure we can handle, you know, probably 15 or 20 staff members in the building at the same time, um, spread out over three floors um, and be socially distanced with appropriate air circulation. Then we start adding people onto that, it gets a little more complicated. Yeah. So the air exchange, um, is a big thing. Um, people who might be um, obviously caring for either children or living with people who are vulnerable or who are themselves a vulnerable population um, will have to deal with that. Um, I'll be talking with HR later this week about some of the implications. The municipal government is different, sometimes a little different when it comes to some of those benefits, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, it's private sector, municipal government, they're different things. So um, um, we'll be talking to them. We want them. We want them. We want everybody to work. Um, but it, it is going to be difficult. It's not going to be comfortable for some folks. So. In, in terms of like limiting the number of people from the public in the building at um, one time, how, is there like, how would that look? I mean, I'm assuming like the building is obviously large, like you're saying. So, you know, there's room for people to kind of disperse. But in terms of like, you know, certain parts of the building aren't necessarily used as much as others. Like, would would there be a staff person like counting, or is it going to just be more of like a visual, like, hey, this looks like we're getting kind of crowded. Let's kind of close the doors for now. Like, what are some thoughts on that kind of counting? <laughs> so the draft the draft plan. Um, first of all, one of the things part of the building preparation will be all that signage, and there will be things like we can get a vinyl floor stickers that say six feet away, you know, stand in line here, we can do things like that. I fully expect to actually have somebody outside the building counting. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't think there's anything, um, if, if, we're, if we're told that based on our capacity, assuming the meeting rooms are out of bounds, assuming we take, let's just say we take, you know, 8,000 square feet off the bat because of employee space and meeting room space, just so you know, now we're down to, thir to 30,000 square feet and we have um, 15 staff members and somehow either the Board of Health or the command systems, command structure says, we think 40 people in the building is adequate. I have no idea what number, it's probably much more complicated than that, but let's just say it's 40 people. We probably would have someone counting 40 people in, 40 out, just like at Market Basket. Yeah. One of the other things is we've talked about um, problem areas, I'll just say it that way. So one of the things we've talked about is having a physical staff person in places like the teen spot, yeah. Yeah. period. There's just going to be an adult sitting there, possibly just reading a magazine, but making sure that what's going on there is monitored. And it's not ideal, it's not, um, but it, it's absolutely needs to be done if we're going to allow people to sit in that space. And those are, as much as I adore them, they are the most, the least uh, reliable. Um, in terms of following the rules. Um, and that was before we had so many rules. So, um, uh, so we would need to make sure that some of those spaces are watched over, but we also have um, not very many, but we have some spaces like down in the ground floor, there's a few nooks and crannies that we would probably have to keep an eye on. Short of physically you know, removing chairs and removing desks, which would help, um, we may have to have some monitoring going on. Up in the children's room, those are family units. So um, some of that's gonna go to people's comfortability with having, you know, do I wanna bring my child in? You know, we won't have play things out. Um, it, the library will not probably be as fun to visit for a little while um, because we don't want people touching all the toys and then leaving. Um, so we have a lot of those, those, those um, manipulatives and things may have to come off the wall. Um, but um, I'm actually, um, if you have seen any of the stuff that our children's librarians are doing, you'll realize we have some really, really amazingly creative folks who are um, learning every day on how to reach um, particularly developing young minds um, and inspiring them with music and rhythm and, and all sorts of other things. So um, the children's room is, is, is gonna be a very different feel um, from where what it used to be for a while. Amy, uh, two things. One, 
you know, I guess I, I guess I'm going to challenge you all. Um, if there's a way to service homebound sooner mm -hmm. than the very end, sure. Um, I know it's difficult. I know they're vulnerable. I know it means going into someone's space yeah. and all that's challenging, but I also see at the food pantry that, you know, they're making it work and it's different because you you're not necessarily going into someone's space, but it's a vulnerable population who's being served. Okay. So I think that's a really great point. We definitely didn't know where to put that because we were very nervous about um, if, if the senior, if Meals on Wheels is going into a property and then the senior center sending somebody for a wellness check and then we're sending someone that seemed like a lot of touches. One of the things, I'm really glad you brought that up because one of the things we have, thought about is how we can partner with like the food pantry or with the senior center. So if we know, if we can coordinate well enough with the senior center to know that, you know, Monette is at home and Monette's going to get this delivery with Meals on Wheels on Tuesdays, can we do the homebound thing so that the Meals on Wheels person can, you know, also drop off a bag of books and, you know, we don't, you know, we'll figure out how to pick up the books. But what, what the concern is with Homebound is that we can't just leave a bag of books outside the door because some of these people are in walkers and they have to pick up, you know. So you do physically, as you mentioned, we have to go into the home. We often will put the bag up on something. We'll unpack the bag for someone. We'll pick things up. So there's a lot of personal interaction. Um, I think the only way we can move that up, and I do think it is a concern because they're just, um, they often don't have the resources that we, that, that many other people have. Right. Um, one of the really important things to do would be to partner with somebody else who's already gone in there, has the Corey check, has the healthcare check, is doing everything else, and is, um, for lack of a better word, certified vulnerable care. Yeah, that's um, Yep. That's the only reason. That's the only way I could see that moving up. Okay. Um, and so that depends on the workload from the Pleasant Street Center and those folks. Okay. Great. Great. Um, and then something to share. I know. Um, you know the work that I'm doing with thinking about how to bring our workforce back. One of the things that we identified from a perspective, designate one stairwell as up and stairwell as down. Ooh, that's really good. So you might better for the you're cutting out a little bit but you you know you could you could have people come in and have to go down and then you use the stairwell on the right all your ups and the stairwell on the left for all the downs yeah but just think about because that's a place where people always cross mm. that's actually a really great idea um we have a lot of people obviously who use, use the elevator as well Right. Um, but, um, and then, um, the ground floor might, yeah. So I think that's a really great idea. Um, and we can look at that workflow. I think the other thing that, um, we didn't talk about, um, but uh, as I was standing at the grocery store the other day, I was thinking like, wow, in some of our closed stacks, we should probably have arrows, like go up this, you know, Right. If you want to go up the romance, you can only go from this end to this end. You, if you, you know, circle back and come back around if you missed your, <laughs> if you missed your comic book. Um, so we, we, we may do that with directionals. The um, sign company that I had in today who does, um, who was willing to cut the acrylic for us. Um, they also do all those types of signs. They do arrows. They'll custom make them. Those are very inexpensive for them to make. They make them to go on floor, um, any kind of floor surface. Um, so, um, you know, the only thing he said is that he said they don't, they don't last too, too long. And I said, I don't want them to last too, too long. They only need to last you know, six months and they don't need to last forever. We'll replace them if they need more. So, um, but yeah, so we'll definitely need directional signs. Um, but, you know, as we walked through the building um, today, it was just really apparent. Um, we crammed a lot of seating in there. We crammed a lot of you know, if you think about the children's room upstairs, there's four computers at each of those. There's, those are quad computers. So those are going to be cut down to two. Plus, we'll need to put a shield in between them. So, yeah, there's a lot of retrofitting that we're going to need to do for a while. So, um, and even if we put it away, we might have to bring it back out. So, one of the things I am also trying to do is make sure most of this stuff is not, um, you know, 
it is or is easily installed and deinstalled. So, um, Amy, do you know if um like the vendors that we order like things like the cleaning supplies and hand sanitizers are they like able are they keeping up with the demand i know that's probably more like the town side of things but yeah, no, that's a great question nina so um like i said um we have um our town is great and emmy you can speak to this we have we are using the incident command system mm -hmm. and the command teams include like the planning and the logistics include people from the facilities department Okay. They have been responsible for getting all the PPE. So they are responsible. So when I go in, um, there's not many of us that go in, but those of us who do go in, there's always a cart that has our gloves and it has extra masks, although most of us have our own masks by now. It has gloves, it has masks, all of our hand sanitizers are filled, all our bathrooms with soap are filled, um, all of that. Um, they have been really great about getting, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, um, I won't speak for every department, but to my knowledge um, and what I saw go through with mass distribution. Um, they have shields for people who need shields. Um, and then um, glo gloves, disposable masks, um, and the cleaning supplies. So the cleaners are still coming in um, because we still have people in the building. Um, there are cleaners and the cleaners, however we decide to open, whether it's just the staff, they, we have contracts, those contracts are, will continue. Um, we have custodians, John, Linda, and Jorge, and Skip are still coming in, and they're doing high-touch surfaces. There's fewer of them because there's few of us in the building. Um, they are keeping very busy doing little fix-its that we didn't didn't have time to do before. Um, and then, um, as if we need anything, I am able to contact anybody on the command team and just say this is what we're going to need, and then they can get back to us. Part of the reason I'm doing the shields by myself is because it's so specific to the library and I need to be there to talk to the vendor. Um, but Joe Huggins from facilities has worked with getting um, the um, plexiglass or whatever they are shields for town hall for like the town clerk's desk and the access the assessors wherever you pay your bills all those places needed to have shields put in. So he's been doing all of those um, and I just told him we'd take care of the library ourselves. And again, they're not, they're not a panacea and masks aren't panaceas and gloves aren't panaceas. It's, it's still, no matter what we do, there's still gonna be a risk coming in. I'm just wondering, Emmy, do you have any advice or suggestions? You seem to have it very well mm -hmm. under control. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I just, I just appreciate, I mean, I think part of the, it's, um, I just appreciate all the work that you guys have done. And every time I tune into a meeting or anything, it's just, it's very well thought out. Um, we have a great, you know, I know you work really closely with Greg and Bob and everything, but they, you know, I, I feel very comfortable and I trust you guys. So you, you guys have given us really great advice so far. So thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can never eliminate risk, unfortunately. And there will always be people who will be uncomfortable with any amount of risk. Um, but you know, you do what you can. And you the what you've come up with so far has been perfectly reasonable. So that's, that's all I need to hear. I mean, as part of the it's not really sort of our reopening, but um, it seems clear that the meeting rooms aren't really going to be getting used for all the sort of activities that they used. To. Have we talked about it all about um, and it's probably going to be state standards and town standards about when we can actually use the meeting rooms to help groups actually have meetings. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I think would be great to do is, and I still haven't figured this out, I, you know, one of the things we thought about was trying to figure out how to facilitate meetings for people who don't, who can't afford to have a Zoom license, so mm -hmm. physically getting that's, them back online. Yep. So that's, that's one thing you know, like we're the, you know, we're the host and then I, you know, Mich you know, if it's Michelle or whoever from the um, meeting room team um, sets up the meeting, gets the host going and then then signs off and gets the co-host that would allow these groups to have uh, some of the advantages of, um, you know, more than 45 minutes. They'd allow, you know, some of the advanced features that you can use um, with Zoom. Um, so that might be one thing, but the physical building, um, Honestly, I have this big 
like wall in my head that's like, no, no, you can't, you can't come in and use our meeting room. Um, uh, so I don't know when that would be. Um, but I, I but, but you did sort of hit on my next point was you know, assuming that's gonna be a long time. Yeah. Um, do we, I sort of know that, you know, through the virtual stuff that we have been doing, you guys have developed some expertise on doing virtual meetings and using Zoom and stuff like that. If we could maybe retouch some of the, some of the groups, you know, the live wires and stuff that we know used to use the meeting rooms um, and have regular meetings, um, some of the book groups and things like that to make sure to let them know that you, we're, we're there to sort of help them go virtual if they haven't been able to figure it out themselves. Sure, I think that's a great service, and maybe we can talk about that. Um, um, we have a couple people. Um, just so you know, Lorraine Berry is on this call. She's monitoring the um, in in the actual universe where people might actually be watching this. She's monitoring to see if there's any emails that come in. Um, and then Michelle Filial. Um, so Lorraine, the head of public services, who deals a lot with our um, public um, requests, and then Michelle is in charge of the meeting room. So. I think that's a really great and interesting idea to see how we can facilitate um, people who are going to not be able to meet in person, how we can help facilitate that continued um, club activity, joining activity and meetup activity, um, since we can't provide a physical space. And my, other, my other thing was when, when we do get to the sort of curbside pickup and things like that, um, I just know personally, my mom's at Pearl Street and they had a little inter internal library, but they're not letting them use that anymore for fear of passing germs around with their books. Um, but we might want to, when we do go to sort of curbside pickup, maybe to try and help facilitate, you know, through Pearl Street or some of the others, like you say, shut-ins, people are having a hard time actually picking up themselves. Um, yeah. Sure could do that, reach out, but. Yeah, no, I think um, that's something. One of the the, um, and this is just sort of an FYI, Kathy Mixis is um, retiring on the twenty first. We are going to do a parade at I think ten o'clock in the morning, um, so you all will be invited, and I'll send you an invite. We're going to do a little parade through the parking lot. We're going to have Kathy um, sitting out there like a um, um, a star, the star that she is. Um, we do have an offer out um, to her, a replacement, um, somebody that uh, Lorraine worked really hard with her team of um, Andrea and Eileen to, to get a, a replacement um, for Kathy. We are on a technical hiring freeze as it were, like we can't really hire anyone because we can't do the physical and the drug tests and all of that until Quadrant opens back up again. But we have a, um, a verbal offer out to, um, to a new person. And this person would be taking on a lot of those elder services. Um, and so, um, it's a great time to bring somebody on board and make some new relationships with um, Pearl Street, artists, um, Sanborn, Tanner, Tannerville, all those places, Bear Mountain, whatever, whatever the new place is called. Um, we always used to have, I believe, deposit collections there, but I believe we can also, we can also do individual Pearl, uh, Lorraine, you're nodding your head. You're on mute. Uh, we do also currently deliver to some individuals in those establishments, so we can go ahead and reach out to more establishments for people that don't have access to their in-house libraries. Okay. And one of the things, Andrew, um, on any of you, um, is that we are really concerned about the people who are who are um, who are missing. Um, we are trying to reach out through the schools to our Medco students. Um, many of them are cut off from services um, simply because they don't have um, the access via technology or Wi-Fi that, that folks in our town do. Um, but also we have people who live in town who don't have access to some of these services that we're offering um, because you need to have a strong Wi-Fi <clears throat> and a strong internet connection and a lot of um, you know technology to do that. So um, we, if you think of groups that we might be missing, um, please let us know. Um, you know, I think the our older population, they're not necessarily streaming via Canopy. So um, they're probably gonna wanna have, have some of these access to some of this other physical materials. Okay. <laughs> Any uh, any other questions or discussion or any questions for Emmy while she's here? 
I take that as a no. Uh, <laughs> Amy, thank you for, um, I, mean, I mean, everything you're doing in town right now, but also for attending tonight and providing some perspective for us. We really appreciate it. And uh, otherwise, uh, is there any other business that we have? Is there anyone? That, if not, uh, should we have a motion to adjourn? I just want to say there were no questions that came in. Okay. Great. Thank you, Lorraine. So do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to move to adjourn. Okay, Andrew, uh, second. Okay. We to, okay, we have to do a roll call again. So Monette? Yep. yep. Andrew? Yes. Dana? Yes. Yes. John, I vote yes. So the the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Amy, thank you for pulling together all this information in the plan. Yeah. And, thank uh, you, Amy. All right. Thanks, thank you. Everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.